Hey, good to see you this morning. Week two of our series, Kaleo, and that's one of those words. You could all say it with me, Kaleo. Doesn't it feel weird to say a word you don't even know what it means, right? It means called, and uh, it's taken from our verse that we start off with, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 21. It says this, to this you were called, and that's the word in Greek, Kaleo. And, and Peter here, you got to realize, Peter, one of the, uh, the oldest of the disciples, he has been to the end of his years. In fact, he's getting ready to be martyred, and uh, he's writing these letters, First and Second Peter, to help Christians who are suffering for the cause of Jesus Christ. They weren't suffering just to suffer. They were suffering because they were Christ followers, and it wasn't cool in their time period to be a Christ follower, not the way it is today. It's more cool to be a Christ follower today. It wasn't then at all. They were being martyred, they were being put to death, they were being uh, exiled, all kinds of different things were happening to these people. And and Peter writes to them to encourage them through their sufferings, not to get, not to, to expect the sufferings to end, but he says, this is what you've been called to. And that word called, I've told you, it's the Greek word kaleo. It actually means, uh, or gives us this idea, the reason that you need to be called is because that you weren't already doing this naturally. Did you get that? That's so important. Um, You weren't already doing this naturally. It sort of reminds me about when I was a kid and my dad had to call me on things. You know what I'm saying? Uh, And my dad made it clear that he wasn't going to call me very often. And when he called, he usually had something in his hand that he was going to wear me out with. And it was a belt, and it it was not always fun. That's what I'm talking about. And and, and yet, God's not threatening us here. I don't want you to get that idea. But he's saying, hey, this isn't something you're already doing. I need to help you with this. And so he says this, and notice this verse. This is such a great verse. In fact, this would be a great verse in the four weeks we're here. I was thinking, like, everybody, you could memorize this verse. Just one verse, four weeks. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And that's the whole point. Peter's saying, hey, you're not exempt from what Jesus called you to do because you, and, and maybe, maybe somebody lied to you when you became a Christ follower. Now, if you're not a Christ follower, you're off the hook. You can just sit back and relax and just, okay, I'm just listening today. See what those crazy Christians are doing. That's fine. But this is for Christians. This is for Christ followers. Because most of the people in this room say, yeah, I, I've accepted Jesus Christ, my Savior, and I want to live that life. I want to. And, and that's what something we don't do. Be honest with you, that's what we're called to. And, and Peter's saying, hey, you know what? You're called to something, and it's not because you've been doing it all your life. I think sometimes we think, well, the day I prayed a prayer, I became a Christian. No, you didn't. <laughs> you just prayed a prayer. You may have gotten saved. To live the life of Christ is way different than praying a prayer. Thank you. To live the life of Christ, I'll say it one more time. Just because you prayed a prayer, just because you got saved, didn't mean you are a Christian. See, there's a lot of people that accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they're not walking in his steps. That's what a Christian is. And that's what we're doing in this series. Four weeks, and last week we talked about the fact that we are called to care. This week we're talking about something that I know nobody wants to hear about today. I know that. But it's something that Jesus talked about more than any other subject that he talked about things. It is the most popular thing, and today we're going to talk about the call to generosity. That's the whole idea. You see, that was such an important topic to Jesus, and, 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 and we're called to walk in his steps, so we've got to see uh, Jesus as a generous person, and, and there wasn't anybody more generous. Now, you sit back and say, well, I don't remember Jesus giving a ton of money. I don't remember. We're not talking about money. Money might be an aspect of generosity, but we're talking about the act of generosity because Jesus is the son of God. There was nobody more generous than God. Generosity is a character trait of God, and that's what we have to understand there. So the question I want you and me to look at as we go through today is the question, how is my generosity shaping my heart? That's an important question. How is my generosity shaping my heart? And we've got a lot to talk about today. But I want you to know, once again, Jesus taught on generosity or, or finances or material possessions more than any other subject, more than he talked about heaven and hell. Oh, really? Yeah. He talked about these things more than any other thing because Jesus taught that money was a method to inspire people to a better relationship with God. But he also knew it was true that sometimes we get derailed on that. See, that's a separator. It's what he was really trying to get across. See, generosity is about this dynamic relationship with God, uh, an, a, an attitude or a, a relationship that's marked with, uh, with dynamic uh, trust, 
contentment, love. And, and it's one of those things that if we fall into this generosity trap, it won't make you a better person, but it will drive you towards a closer relationship with God if you're already a Christ follower. Because that's what God is like. The most quoted verse in all the world, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he, come on, what? He gave. And you only give like that. What did he give? He gave his own, one and only son. One and only son. If I had one and only son, now I have two, so I can spare one. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, actually, Dwight taught me that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. If I did not, I just told a lie, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fess up to it. So, I was just preaching is what they call that. Um, no, I just I, I want to make sure you guys are listening, especially Ben. Um, <laughs> no, God said, "Hey, I am so generous that I will give you the one thing I only have one of that I would never want to give away, but I'm gonna give away my one and only Son, and He gave us Jesus Christ to die in our place." And I hope we never get over that fact. And, and, and the question, how is generosity shaping my heart, should shape us. But the problem is, you know this to be true, that sometimes we chase the false riches of life. See, when we chase those false riches, the things of this world, the material gain, the cars and jobs and promotions and all these things that we think are so important, what do we get? Pride, coveting, anxiety. And it fosters a separation from God. And these are things that the Bible, Jesus himself taught these things. And I want to make sure we're clear on it. So uh, in our, uh, we got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to try and get to it as quickly as possible. Matthew chapter 6 is where we're going to be today. So if you have your Bibles, and I encourage you, bring your Bibles to church. You say, well, you always put the verses up there. I know, but you should follow along. Have a sense of where things are so that when somebody talks to you about it, work, or whatever, you can go, hey, I've got this marked out in my Bible. I know where this is at. Matthew chapter 6 this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon Jesus ever preached that was recorded for us. It includes chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the book of Matthew. Jesus said so many incredible things. He said things like, turn the other cheek. He said, go the extra mile. Uh, judge not. That's in this. He, he said all kinds of great things. Even the Lord's Prayer is recorded. The model prayer is recorded in this. But in Matthew chapter 6, these are, once again, familiar passages. So I get a little nervous when I'm talking about familiar passages, people who've been in church for all their lives. Don't ignore the truth of the word of God just because you've heard it before. Maybe God's going to open your ears to something new. He says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 19. He says, do not, uh-oh, do not. There's that don't do stuff. And isn't that what church is all about? Don't do stuff. Preachers always say, don't do this, do this. Well, Jesus is actually saying it this time. He says, do not, and he's talking to his followers. So once again, if you're not a Christian, you're off the hook today. This doesn't apply to you. He's talking to people who would be residents of his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And he says, do not store up yourselves treasures on earth. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's what we work all our lives for. Isn't that why you're working every day? You may not call them treasures, but you call them things like cars, right? Boats. We talked about that this morning. Don't you all wish you had a friend who had a boat, right? <laughs> that was our discussion this morning in men's breakfast. I remember that one. Uh, we had those kind of discussions. They're deep theological discussions. About the treasures of earth. He says, don't waste your time. Don't do it. Don't waste your time storing up for yourselves things here. Don't build up your 401, 403, or any other Roth or whatever IRA you got. Don't waste your time. That's Jesus' words, not mine. He says, don't do it. Why? Because politics will fail you and your economic balance is going to drop through the floor, isn't it? That's what he says. He says it this way. He says, we're moths and vermin. That's the political guys, the vermin. Where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves, that's the other half of the political group, where thieves break in and steal. And that's the do not. So Jesus is going to give us a do. Here's the do. He says, but, but, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Huh. What kind of treasures might those be? Well, he's, he wants us to understand what they are, what they look like at least. He says, where moth and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Great, that's awesome. And then he says in verse number 21, the verse that, that, that sort of caps it off of this little section, he says, for where your treasure is, where is it? Where is your treasure? How is this shaping, how is generosity shaping my heart? This is the question he's asking. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says it's so important that you understand that. And we sit back and go, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he, he skipped down a couple of verses, and he gives us in verse 24 this important thought. 
He says, no one, no one. And I want you to understand, when he says this, he means no one, not, not anybody in here. Somebody in here is going to think, well, I, this doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to me. The only people that are off the hook, I told you, are people who don't know Jesus Christ. So you're off the hook. But if you're a Christ follower, this applies to you. This applies to me. He says, no one. No one can serve two masters. No one. Why? Because you'll either hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one. Notice he changes the words a little bit. Devoted to the one and despised the other. And just to make sure, he, he wants us to understand exactly what he's saying here. He gives us that one little sum up, Satan. Here it is. You cannot. You cannot. There are people who think they can, but you cannot. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't. If you're in here sitting back going, well, you don't understand, preacher. I've got to work hard. I've got to do all these things. And then one day I'm going to sit back and serve God. No, can't do it. Can't do it. I, I didn't make the rules. God did. Jesus said this. In fact, the word money there, and some of the other translations, it uses this word that we'd never use anymore because it's so archaic, mammon. Um, it's so archaic that probably no, none of us really understand what exactly it means, but it means all your material goods, all of it. And he says, you can't do that. You can't have your cake and eat it too. And you know what Jesus is really saying? Jesus is saying, I want to identify you, uh, I want to identify money, material gain, mammon, as the one competitor that competes with God more than any other thing for your heart. Do you see how important this is? Jesus is passionate about this. And I think sometimes we just read and go, yeah, 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 these were good verses I read back in Sunday school. Jesus is saying, listen, it will rob you of a good life. And if you want the life that I have, remember Jesus? Jesus is the same guy that when some disciples come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, we're all in. We, we, we want to follow you now. And Jesus, he wasn't trying to rain on the parade, but he looks at him and he says, you know, the foxes, they have holes. And the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. You know, he wasn't trying to be, Mr., I'm raining on your parade. You know what he's trying to say? You don't get your cake and eat it too. It's the same thing that Peter was telling us back in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, when he says, hey, you know what? You need to walk where Jesus is walking. I want you to know, Jesus is walking in places where he's suffering. He was an example for you so that you would do the same thing he does. And what did he do? He was so generous. And today, I want to look at, in our short time, I want to look at four shifts that we need in our mindsets to be able to walk in those steps of Jesus on that path of generosity. And these are four, uh, four shifts that we need because every one of them are so hard to do. So let's look at them real quick. Number one, it's a shift from pride to gratitude. You see, the biggest problem in our lives as Christians, and I'm not talking Sunday people. I know a lot of people, we want to pitch this back and say, yeah, this is for somebody who doesn't, doesn't know Jesus. No, this is for us as Christians. The biggest problem we have, and we start on this journey of, of learning how to be generous like Jesus is, because we all think we're generous. Well, I gave some money. I, I, I tipped God this morning as I came in. No, no, no. We're talking about being generous in a lifestyle. Generous to the point where you say, hey, I want to live the life Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He gave up his life. Remember what Jesus told his disciples? If you want to show love for one another, the best way you can do it is lay down your life. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a Christian do that. Not in my lifetime. Now, I've, I've read books about people doing it. But the truth of the matter is we don't like to give up that much. Hey, I can give up 2 or $3 in the offering plate, make everybody feel good. And even if we take up a special offering, I can do that. I can bring in a bag of candy every once in a while. But we're talking about being generous, the way God was generous. And none of us do that. And you know why? We're born in pride. We're, we're, we're overwhelmed in pride. In fact, one of the reasons why the church isn't doing a great job of reaching the world is because we're living in pride. And, and the first step in this, this, this journey towards uh, generosity is to move from pride to gratitude because pride, and here it is, pride is imagining it's my own efforts. It's, it's our own efforts that brought about all the good in my life. Pride's that thing that we sit back and say, yep, I'm a good Christian Southern young man. I went out and worked hard this week and look what I've provided. That's a lie. That's pride. But I've never seen one person in a church come ever come forward and say, you know, God, forgive me for that pride. But I've seen a whole lot of men, especially, and this is one of the biggest sins that men have, 
sit back and go, yep, I worked 80 hours this week, and that was in the first three days. We do this. In fact, I, I, I mean, I, if I sit around here long enough in our church, we're going to have a bunch of men, and I, some of them be embarrassed right now, but they're going to sit, sit back and talk about how many hours they worked in a short amount of time. And you know what that is? It's pride. You know what you're saying? Look what I've done. You're not the creator. God is the creator. God is the humbler of us. I think that was one of the lessons we should have gotten out of COVID. And you know what? God says, if you want to learn to be generous and give up everything, start by getting rid of the pride in your life, and let's move from pride to gratitude, because pride swallows up our gratitude. It does. Pride gives us that, that idea uh, of, I did it, and it robs us of the joy of God's grace, because grace isn't something you ever earn. And this is why Christians have a hard time witnessing to the world, because we lack the grace that it takes, Right? Because we think we earned it. Look what I've done. I've cleaned myself up. Pretty good looking on Sunday morning. And you guys are pretty good looking. <laughs> Humble too. <laughs> you know, when we put our, our confidence in ourselves rather than in our creator, we become puffed up and we develop a warped perspective of who we are. And that's what Jesus was so worried about for these people. He didn't think they were going to have so much money that, that they needed to give it up and it was going to uh, uh, overwhelm them. They, he knew they were poor people. Because some of us, we sit back and go, I don't have any money in my bank account. I'm poor. But you know what? It's that whole idea of generosity gives more than I have. Generosity gives it all. gives it all away. And embracing gratitude over pride is the first step on this path to generosity. But here's the problem. The problem is we live in America, and America is the home of the self-made man, isn't it? In fact, that's the symbol of our culture today. Success would equal the self-made individual. Hey, success, and I don't know if you honestly would ever be able to answer that question, what is success? Some of us, it would be owning our own home, owning two or three cars, trucks, whatever, owning a boat, owning whatever, uh, crazy equipment, guns, because we all define it differently. We do, but the truth of the matter is that is a self-made man. And, and, and self-sufficiency or pride often creeps in very slowly, very stealthily. Um, I think one of the best passages in the Bible to see this is found in John's letter to um, uh, the letter of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, let me explain it real quick before we read into it, because I won't want you getting ahead. John here, who was Jesus' closest disciple, at least his, he, that's how he called himself. He said, I'm the disciple who Jesus loves. He was the youngest. Where Peter was the oldest, John's the youngest. John was in the inner circle. John was everywhere with Jesus, even to the very end. He was so close to Jesus. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, he looks down at John and says, Hey, John, take care of mom. That's how close he was. That's pretty close, I would say. Wouldn't you? So John, he's lived this long life, and he's so tough. I mean, John is a tough bird. He's so tough when they try and kill him by boiling him in oil, he doesn't die. He survives that kind of torture, and I don't know what he looked like. He was probably a mess by now, but he's exiled to this island, and on this island, he is granted a revelation or a revealing, that's, the, that's what the word revelation means, a revealing of who Jesus Christ is. Now, you say, well, I know who Jesus is. He's the guy on the cross, right? He's the guy that Catholics wear on their crucifix and all kinds. Of, no, no, no. That's what John's trying to say. He's not that guy. He was that guy. He was, he was short, shortly, he was, for 33 years, he was that guy. But really, when you get to the end, the last book of our Bible, the book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and that's what the full title really is, John says, let me tell you who Jesus really is. Because you thought he was a humble little man born in a manger. He's really that king on a throne. And he's so powerful that, man, I, I don't know what to describe him. We used to describe him as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, but really he's the lion that will tear us up. He's the judge. He's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He's got white hair. Lightning and fire comes from his eyes. His tongue is like a sword that chops all the nations down. And he begins describing this crazy picture of this God who is so omnipotent, so omniscient, so omnipresent that it's scary. And all the nations of the world quake. And John doesn't even have the words to really give us the best picture, and that's what Revelation's really all about. And he starts off, because he's getting this from God, and he doesn't understand everything he's, he's seeing. He's writing it down, though. And he gets this, it begins with this letter, or these letters, to seven churches. They were seven real, literal churches in Asia Minor. 
And each one of these churches, though they were real churches and, and God's dealing with real problems in them, they actually represent church ages or, or time periods of, of churches. And we get to this one, the church age of Laodicea, and they were a real church. They represent really our time period here. And in Ro Revelation chapter 3, in, in verse number 17, it starts, and, and, and I'm picking the middle because there's a lot he says. But notice what he says about them in this area of generosity, and this is how important it was. And think about it being our time period and Christians or churches during our time period. He says this. This is Jesus speaking to the church. He says, you say, church, I am rich. I have acquired wealth. Do you see how that pride is there? And do not need a thing. I'm good. I don't need anything. I, I don't know. I'm fine. But you do not realize. You don't understand that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. That's pretty rough. So he goes on. He says, what can I do for you? He says, I counsel you. I want to I help you. I want to tell you what you should do. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. Gold that's not of this earth, something that's heavenly, heavenly treasure. So why? So you can become rich. Because remember what he just said? You're poor. You're poor. And, and not just buy, uh, I just don't want you to buy gold, but I want you to put on white clothes. White clothes, why? He goes on to say, to, uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to help me, uh, uh, go on to the next slide there, uh, to, to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve to put on your eyes so you can see, because all those things are true about you. And then he says in verse 19, he says, this is why. Not, uh, he goes, I'm not preaching at you to make, make you feel bad, but I want you to know those whom I love, the people who are closest to me. Now, once again, he's writing to a church full of Christians. He's not writing to unsafe people. He's writing to Christians because they're not living up to his standard. That's what this is all about. And he says, to those whom I love, the love of God's in you, I'm rebuking you and disciplining because you're just like children to me. So be earnest, be real, be honest. And you know what? When we're talking about moving from pride, uh, out of pride, into gratitude, that's tough, man. Nobody wants to hear that. But you got to be humble. you got to be earnest. And he says, repent, change. And then he says a verse that is one of the most uh, taken out of context verses ever because everybody uses this for salvation and it has nothing to do with salvation because he's writing to people who are already saved. And he says this, and we all see the picture. We've seen the, the, the track that's so, um, so not true. He says, here I am. I stand at the door. And everybody's like, it's the door of your heart. It's not. It's the front door of the church. He says, I stand at the door. Why? Because you kicked me out of your church because you weren't serious about me. You're living for yourself. Your pride has kicked me out. You, you argue about carpets and pews, and you argue about paint and all the dumb stuff but you forget about what the purpose was. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. <laughs> it's my church. I should be able to come in, right? And eat with that person and they with me. That's what he's talking about here. He says, you know, Laodicea, they were so prosperous. They had so much. They had so many uh, modern conveniences in their time period. They were unlike most of the, the, the poor places around. They were so wealthy and they didn't think they had needs. And even in the church, it had spilled into the church. And that's what he's saying, hey, if you repent of your prideful, independent attitudes, you get the real riches of a deep relationship with God. Essentially, God wants our heart. That's what this is all about. You think he wants your wallet. He doesn't want your wallet. He wants your heart. But you know what stands in the way of him getting your heart? Your stuff. Because how many times I heard people like, I couldn't make it to church because I had to do this, I had to do that, I had to do this. And I'm thinking, God just wants your heart. Those things, if they're standing in the way between you and a relationship with God, they're stealing you, they're robbing from you. Get rid of the pride and move forward. Ask what is beneath, what is underneath all my financial behaviors? What is shaping my generosity? See, we need to understand that gratitude is the thread that ties together the gospel, our generosity, and God's grace in our own hearts. So what do we do? <laughs> That's the easy thing. Here's the answer. Now that you know what the problem is, problem number one, we're supposed to take a shift from pride to gratitude. So how do, how do we do it? Here it is. Practically, we need to see everything as a gift. 
Stop looking at it and saying, I earned this. I made this. I worked hard for this. I own this. You own nothing. God gave you everything. Amen. When was the last time you thanked God for the things that are so simple? Go to the faucet and turn on. You know what? This is where the Jewish culture has its beat. They bless God over 5,000 times a day in a, in, a, um, in a Jewish home. Because when they turn on a faucet and water runs out of it, you know what they do? They stop and pray a prayer. Thank you, God, for water, the gift of life. When was the last time you did that? Nope, paid my water bill. I don't need to thank God for that. That's how we live in America. That's a prideful attitude and it keeps us from being generous. That's the problem. Number two. Second, the second shift we need to make is a move from coveting to contentment. Coveting to contentment. This is so interesting here. Because coveting, it, 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 or, I'm sorry, contentment, let me back up. Back up. Contentment is a posture of the heart that rests peacefully in our present circumstances, no matter what they look like. <laughs> I always think about Paul in Philippians chapter number four. Paul understood this because he had been this, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more. And then Jesus changed his life. And the next thing you know, he has nothing. And he's working hard. And, and he's being beaten and he's shipwrecked. And, and nobody gives him any time of day. I mean, he's ostracized. He's in prison. And what does Paul write? He says, you know what? I've learned to be content with what I have. And he's honest with this because he says things like, you know, there was times in my life when I had a lot. And there was times when I didn't have anything. And it's okay either way, because I have God. And that's the contentment he had in his life. And, and the, problem, the problem with this aspect of t- moving from coveting to contentment is that our culture is, is driven by a consumer mentality, and it's driven our Christianity into a consumer mentality. You know why? Go to the average church. You go to our church. You walked in this morning, and you don't have to admit to this. Please don't admit to this. But man, some of you sat there during the music and said, hmm, I don't like the songs she picked out. I wish we'd sing my songs. Mm-hmm. That's a good worship experience, isn't it? I want what I want. Didn't we come here to worship God? Then why are you worshiping you? Because every time you tell me you want things a certain way, I want a choir, and I want this, and I want that, and I want this, you know what you're saying? Worship me, not God. It's me. It's all about me. You know who it's really all about? It's about the, the, the father who gave us a son, dying on the cross, and he wants us to go out and tell other people. And you know why I know why he wants to come in and hear that truth? Because we're making it all about me. We are. Hey, we got to move from coveting to contentment, and we got to learn to be, hey, you know what? I'm happy because everything I have in my life is a gift, and I've got to move from pride into gratitude, be thankful for everything, see everything as a gift, but I've also got to move from coveting to contentment, and this is so hard. Because when we do this, when I start realizing that contentment is the ultimate goal of my life, then I start feeling satisfied rather than the rest of society where where we're restless for more. Because they bank on you being restless to need the next iPhone, whatever it's at now, 15 or whatever. Right? Or those folding phones, or uh, maybe you're not into phones, maybe it's guns. Mm, I know, it's a sore spot with the men right here. Women, before you start laughing, purses and shoes and anything else you can get your hands on. I don't know. Because, it, hey, this isn't a you problem. This isn't a me problem. This is an us problem. That's why Jesus says, hey, we need to walk in this path of, of generosity, which we all think we are, but we're really not, because we are more into coveting than contentment. And here's our problem. <laughs> this coveting isn't the desire to steal or take that something at somebody else's. Notice this definition. This is so important. Coveting is the belief that if I just had more, I'd be happy. Guilty. Every one of us, isn't it? <laughs> That's true. Come on. It is. Every one of us, we're guilty of coveting here. I just proved it. Because every one of us, we eat a piece of pie and go, oh, I just, that was so good, I need more. Mm-hmm. Right? Come on. And that's just the little things. I mean, we can be all guilty, but it gets worse when we start doing it over bigger things. I got to have more cars than I have drivers in my family, more vehicles. Oh, now he's gone to meddling. It's true. We just keep saying, I got to have bigger homes. I remember my wife and I, we lived down in, in uh, Sanford, Florida for years. And Sanford's not a very, uh, very nice, uh, as far as riches, 
place. It doesn't have a lot of money or all that. But if you go just a little while, uh, ways over next to, next to Lake Mary, there's a place called Heathrow. Heathrow has, I don't know, five, six, seven gated communities in it that the homes in there run in the millions. I remember looking at an advertisement. You can't go in there because they're gated. I mean, they hire police. You can't go in there. I, I was in there one time. In fact, I went to, um, I was on a ride along, got to go into um, Aliqua to see Shaquille O'Neal's uh, house, his parents' house. He lived over there. A lot of those kind of people. I mean, they got money. We did a, we did a, a, a drive-in to see, check on his mom because she wasn't answering her phone. And he wanted her to be notified. So he called the sheriff's department. So we went in there and checked on her. Um, she wasn't in town. You see these homes. I, I remember watching this, looking at this advertisement in this home. Seven bathrooms. Who needs seven bathrooms? I mean, you got some, you got some gastro uh, problems there. I'm just saying, if you need those kind of bathrooms, go to the hospital, man. <laughs> but seven bathrooms, and I don't know how many bedrooms, and they had an indoor pool and, and a movie theater and a bowling alley, and they had outdoor tennis courts. And I was thinking, I saw this, and I was like, wow. You know, come on. Everybody does this. And, and, and I remember I, I, we were talking, my wife and I were talking about stuff like this. And, and she's like, I don't think I'd want one of those. I was like, why? She goes, that's a lot more to clean. <laughs> and, 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 and yeah, but we often don't look at things like that because we think more equals happy. Bigger is better in America, isn't it? That's what we've been taught. Lie. Better is better. <laughs> come on, bigger isn't better. Better is better. More doesn't make me happy. If it was true, then all the people in Hollywood would be happy, wouldn't they? All the, the millionaires. Hey, Bill Gates wouldn't have divorced his wife. Yeah, come on. That's the truth. They wouldn't be trying out drugs. That's a lie. It's a form of idolatry. This coveting is a form of idolatry that leads us away from God. And here's, here's something so profound. I, I just, it just blew me away when I came across this. Sinful desire for more leads our hearts away from God. And when we look through the Bible, there are two types that are expressly mentioned over and over again in the Old Testament. And then I came across it in the New Testament, and it just, I'd, I'd read this passage over and over again and never made the connection. Hebrews, chapter number 13. The author of Hebrews is writing some exhortations at the end. And he writes this passage, and he says this. Now listen to what he's going to say. This is so, I thought he was just randomly like, Eh, just said this, and then just said that, and just said that off the top of his head and couldn't think of anything else, so they didn't go together, but they go together. He said marriage. Marriage. Yay, marriage is a good thing, right? Right? Hey, congratulations to Charles and Sarah for 50 years. Give it up for them, yeah. That's an awesome thing. It, it really is. He says marriage should be honored by all. And that's one of the problems in our society. It's not anymore, but it should be. And the marriage bed kept pure. That means he's talking like no sex before marriage, none of those kind of things. Don't be, don't be adulterous. Don't be, we know all those things. He goes on. He says, for God, this is your reasoning. You better know this. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. And we're all like, yep, that's why we got to stay pure, right? Amen. And then this is where it gets crazy, because if you have a Bible that, doesn't, that shows paragraphs, there isn't a new paragraph here. This is one thought. He goes on to say this, and I was like, what? This doesn't make sense. He says, keep your lives free. He just talks about marriage. He says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. He just talked about adultery, fornication, pornography, all those things that could be bad, that God's going to judge you because marriage should be honorable. Do it the way God says to do it. Don't do it your own way. And then he goes right into it because what he's saying is something that the Old Testament says too, that there are two sins that greatly disrupt our relationship with God. And those two sins, those two sins are sexual sin and coveting. He goes on to finish the verse out, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And he's given us hope there in that. But I thought, this is so crazy. And you know what? I was realized this. You know what? Our culture, the, what you live in every day, you know what our culture teaches us to be generous with sex? It's everywhere, isn't it? Be generous with sex, and 
closely guard your money. You know what God's word teaches? To be generous with money and closely guard your purity. And don't we have it backwards in our culture? And that's so profound there. That's throughout the whole Bible. And these are truths that, man, this is part of generosity. You thought I was just going to talk about money today. This is part of generosity. Because what God's saying here when he does this is when we spend all of our income on ourselves in the pursuit of fulfillment, when I go on these wild shopping sprees that I just think I got to have more, 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 you know what he says? He says that's like regularly committing adultery. Yeah, dropped the microphone there, didn't we? That's how God looks at it. And that makes sense when you turn over to, go, uh, to um, Hosea and you read about Gomer and Hosea and you read Jeremiah's, we just got done in Sunday school studying through Jeremiah and you realize over and over and over again, you know what God kept saying? You guys are adulterers, you're fornicators, you're whoring after prostitutes. And you know what he's talking about? The coveting nature of Israel, Judah, which is really the coveting nature of Christians, too. Because we think, eh, i got to have a little bit more. And he says, that's not going to satisfy you. It's not. See, that's the problem we have. Jesus warned about the dangers of a, per, a continual pursuit of riches without any limits. Over in Matthew chapter 13, he tells the parable of the sower and the seeds. And we know that, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in his interpretation, as he's telling the disciples what it means... He says this in verse 22. Look what he says. He says, the seed falling among the thorns. That was one of the four types. He says, the seed falling among... Now, the seed is the word of God, just so you understand that. He says, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Jesus himself is trying to help us understand if we're going to be generous. We have to move from coveting to contentment. So what do we do? We've got to learn to spend modestly. Spend modestly. You know, we live in this day and age where eat, drink, and be merry. Buy everything you can, spend everything, borrow it on credit, do whatever you can to get whatever you want. That's not what God says. He says, be generous. And sometimes generous means don't spend it all. Slow down. The third shift we need is a shift from anxiety to trust. And you know, every one of these ramps it up a little bit more, isn't it? Anxiety to trust. See, the problem, the problem is money is the leading cause of stress in the United States. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's pretty obvious. In fact, it's one of the top topics that couples discuss in divorce because it often isn't the cause of divorce, but it usually is a big problem leading to divorce. And that is a problem for us. Why? Because when we have anxiety, it shows that we have a lack of trust in God's promises and his provision. And Jesus, what did he say? Back over in our, our text in Matthew, he says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 31, so do not, what's that word? And that wasn't the preacher saying that, that's Jesus Christ saying that. Because I know sometimes we're like, oh, somebody tells me one more time not to be anxious. Because I have an anxiety. In fact, that's one of the biggest common problems in the 21st century among Americans. Because we have so much, we worry. We worry about losing our stuff. And he says, hey, don't worry. Don't you worry. And what does he tell us not to worry about? Well, we're going to eat. Some of you guys are already planning your lunch today. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Those are the big needs of life, aren't they? And don't even worry about what you're going to wear. He skips down a couple verses and he tells you why. And I like this. He says, this is what you need to do. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And you know what he's saying there? The reason you worry so much is you aren't thinking about God. You're thinking about you. You're thinking about what you need to eat, what you need to drink, what you need to wear. And you say, well, those are all important things in life. He, he isn't saying they're not. He's saying, don't put those as your first priority because they'll make you anxious. He says, all the things that you need. All the bare necessities of life. Now, if you're sitting back saying, God, I need me a Mercedes or a whatever you want, he's not, he's not on that path with you. But he's saying all the things that are necessary for you to exist, they're going to be given to you. If you put God in the proper per relationship, you know why? Because when you do that, you're putting the responsibility of the, 
of, of everything in your life that you need on God, not on you. <laughs> it goes back to that first one, right? Pride. You got to get rid of pride to move to gratitude. And that's the first step. We got to get rid of coveting to move to contentment. We got to get rid of anxiety in order to move to trust. Because learning to trust God enables us to find an authentic security and satisfaction in the one who actually is our provider. See, having more has never solved the anxiety of our lives. It actually adds to the problem. The more you have, the more you worry, the more you need, the more you, oh, stresses you out, doesn't it? So the question I have, do you trust God enough to not worry about your stuff, to not worry about your circumstances? Do you trust God? Maybe that's the question you need to ask yourself. Do I trust God enough today not to worry? That's a tough one there. See, worry says it all depends upon me. Fear and anxiety compel us to adopt a scarcity mindset where uh, we, we need to have that abundance mindset because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, what the psalmist said. He owns the wealth in every mine. And I don't have to worry about it because my father is king of the universe. I don't care what the government calls taxes. I don't care about any of this stuff. God will supply all my need. That's what Paul said. In a prison, in Rome, God will supply all my, what's that word? Need. That's what he's going to do. He's going to supply it. I don't have to come up with it. Now, it doesn't mean I get to be lazy and do nothing. I'm supposed to be following in his footsteps. Actually, what it implies is that I'm supposed to be following his footsteps, giving away as much as I can give away. Because the truth of the matter is, the more you can give away, the better God supplies your needs. That's just how it works. It's crazy, isn't it? See, we are often deceived into embracing a false system of measuring our security. Generosity eliminates money's power over it and amplifies God's or our trust in God. And so what should we do? <laughs> if we're going to beat anxiety and, and move to trust, we have to learn to save wisely. Save wisely. That's just the easy step there, which leads me to number four. The shift to move from indifference to love. Indifference to love. See, the problem is focusing on myself, lacking the, the generosity that God wants for me, and not walking in Jesus' foot. So focusing on self keeps me unconcerned for others. And that's a generosity problem. See, you thought it was all about money. It's really not. It's about an attitude. See, generosity, according to what Jesus would tell you, generosity demands giving. Generosity demands giving. So why should I give? See, what we should understand about giving is giving starts out not out of love, but it starts out as an act of obedience. Giving, if, if you struggle with giving, of being generous, let me just tell you, you have to do it and learn to be obedient first. As you do it long enough, it turns from obedience to an act of love. And that's the great news about generosity. God wants us to learn how to love. And that's what he said when he said, hey, I love the world so much that I'm going to give the greatest gift of all. Back over in Matthew, our text, he says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your, your heart will be also. And what Jesus is saying in, that, in this is that generosity, generosity, and, and, and I want to break this to you, generosity is just a means to an end. That's what Jesus is trying to get us across to us. Generosity is just a means to an end in our life. It's an investment in the love of God for us first. <laughs> he doesn't hold back from you. He wants you to invest in generosity because you get the love of God first, and then you get to share it with other people also. And that's what's great about generosity. See, if we want God's heart, then we learn to give to the things that he cares about. And so what do we do? To solve this one out, to go from this, this problem of indifference that I don't really care about my fellow person to love, I have to learn to give extravagantly. And that's the toughest of all. Because like I said, we like to give what's in our pocket, the, the cheap stuff. If it doesn't cost me anything, if I don't need it for anything else, I'll give. But that's not the way God gives, is it? God gives so much more, so much more. So here it is. If I'm going to sum up what I've talked about today in one sentence, here it is. 
Generosity, this is what you need to know. Generosity is the visible evidence of love. Last night, we were privileged to go and, and celebrate Charles and Sarah's <clears throat> 50th anniversary. And that was an awesome thing. And you know what I realized last night as I was thinking about our sermon and everything? I, I always look around and think about things. And I was thinking about this. All the hard work that their kids and grandkids and everybody's put into this, you know what it was? It was an act of love. And when we love enough, what we are showing is generosity. I appreciate it. I didn't have to pay it. I, to be honest with you, I, they didn't ask me to cover dinner last night. I don't know if anybody else, did, did you get a bill? Okay, I didn't get a bill. Probably should have. But they were showing us love by being, <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> generosity was an evidence of love. See, their kids, their grandkids loved enough to help out and serve to do things that sometimes were uncomfortable, I'm sure. Uh, why? Because they love their, their mom, their dad, grandma, grandpa. They love them. And that's just the greatest act. And you know what Jesus wants from us? To show the world that he loves them. And how do we do that? By being stingy, by acting like worship's about what we want, not about what they need. No, it's about visible evidence of God's love. So let me ask you this. How, how is generosity shaping your heart today?